So now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Juhani Grossman, who will present key findings of the survey. Juhani leads the Basel Institute Green Corruption Program, which targets environmental degradation through an anti-corruption, asset recovery, and governance approach. He joined the Basel Institute in April 2020, and prior to joining the Institute, Juhani spent nine years leading anti-corruption and good governance in Indonesia. This included managing the $25 million uh, USAID funded SIGA project, which advised 17 government agencies on their respective integrity building efforts. With that, Juhani, the mic is yours. Thank you, Shkini, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I understand that you've had very illustrious speakers in previous events, so we'll try to, to make it justice. So just to clarify, Yuhani is me, uh, and not, not this gentleman over here. That's Cameron, who is going to be helping me with the technical presentation. So um, first of all, I thought I would start by talking a little bit about why we conducted the survey, or why, why we thought it was important, and then highlight a few of the key findings because, before I hand it over to my uh, co-panelists who have uh, exceptionally deep expertise uh, in sur conducting surveys and in governance as well. Um, so uh, so fr from the beginning, uh, the reason why we wanted to understand the concept a little bit better is that uh, the linkage between environmental crime and corruption has um, become increasingly prominent over the last few years. Um, and uh, and is in everybody's mouth, at least uh, those folks who work in the governance sector, uh, but at the same time, the linkage is not very well understood, unfortunately. Uh, and so uh, we had the opportunity to work with um, LSI as one of the leading survey groups in Indonesia to try and get a little bit of a better sense of how the, um, these two topics interact, these two scourges that interact, that not just Indonesia, but all countries in the world suffer from both of these issues. Everybody has environmental problems, everybody has governance problems. So. Um, I think um, as key takeaways, I would, um, and I'll just share my, my uh, few illustrative examples here with you. Um, so are you able to see my screen? Let's see. Yeah. Hold on one second. We'll try that again. Two years into a pandemic and we still have the same issues. All right, can you see my presentation now? Okay. Um, so um, um, so the, the survey we thought allowed us to gain a really good insight into what people actually think about the issue. Uh, and, and what we discovered, we call the a paradox because uh, it's very obvious that Indonesian citizens are able to hold together a number of opinions related to governance and the environmental sector that might on the surface appear contradictory. So to go into some more detail, could I have the next slide please, Cameron? Thank you. So um, when we look at uh, what people think about the level of corruption uh, and trust in government. On the first box on the left-hand side, um, you, see, um, you see three core institutions in the governance field, the president, the anti-corruption agency, KPK, and, and the police, and how trust in those agencies evolved over the last five years. Uh, arguably, uh, those three are the core, the key agencies in fighting corruption. And while we see that trust in the presidency has remained uh, reasonably stable over the, the five years, um, we see a very um, noticeable trend uh, in a decrease in trust in the Corruption Eradication Commission, especially over the last uh, 18 months or so. Um, and that comes from a degree of trust that was really stratospheric. Um, and those of you who have been students of Indonesia know KPK very well. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it because we have the true expert on the issue uh, following me. Um, but I wanted to highlight the fact that this decrease of trust in the corruption eradication, especially over the last 18 months, 
uh, is a truly seismic shift in the anti-corruption environment in Indonesia. Um, it is also accompanied uh, notably by a similarly seismic shift and an increase in trust in police, um, which had very low trust levels five years ago and now basically um, meets those of the KPK. On the right hand uh, box, um, we uh, have a similar time frame and we ask citizens whether they believe that corruption has increased, decreased, or remained the same over the last five years. And what you can see during a similar time period that we see a decrease of trust in KPK, we see also a vast increase in those uh, who believe that corruption has gotten worse. So uh, in November 2020, it was 40% of the public that said so. Now we're up to 60%. So two thirds of the public says that corruption is getting worse. That's a really high level. Next slide, please. Again? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, when we try to bring these two things together, environmental degradation and corruption, um, we find that citizens are very concerned about both issues, actually. Those are, uh, we see that 70% uh, of respondents agree that um, uh, the government is doing its best it can to balance economic growth and environmental degradation and can be trusted to protect the environment. Now, this is a number worth keeping in mind because um, as we see at the same time on the left-hand side, between 96 and 97% of the public care greatly uh, about jobs and employment and economic growth and an almost similar level of folks care about environmental degradation and climate change. So these are major concerns of everybody involved. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Thank you. So when we look at um, when we look at management of natural resources, we have one very uh, notable observation, which is that the public is highly skeptical of the private sector's role in managing natural resources. Um, obviously, the private sector is very involved, but it is nonetheless very skeptical. Um, and this is, this is a big challenge. Uh, what we see is that the vast majority of the public prefer these natural resource extraction in all fields to be handled by state-owned enterprises and by uh, cooperatives. Next slide, please. <coughs> so here is just the sectors broken down, um, highlighting the points I made before. If you look at the orange, um, orange colored um, boxes, they refer to um, those who want state-owned enterprises to manage these fields, so mining, wildlife, waste processing, plantations, and fishing. And the brown boxes refer to people cooperatives. And the little tiny one in the middle that's black are foreign companies. And this is a topic that we will refer to uh, again going into the future. Uh, I would also highlight one point here is that while there is great skepticism among, among the public, uh, for the private sector managing natural resources, there is relatively little support to stop the exploitation of natural resources. You can see those are the green, the green boxes. So they don't go above 10% of the public except for wildlife, where it's still relatively low at 16%. So what we can see is that the public does want to utilize the natural resources, but not the way that they have been utilized so far. And they prefer um, state-owned enterprises or um, cooperatives to handle those. Next slide, please. Um, thank you. So um, I mentioned foreign investment just to highlight here that um, uh, the public very strongly uh, agrees with government of Indonesia efforts to limit foreign invest investors' engagements uh, in all sectors, actually. Um, you can see that the, the limits uh, are about uh, 80%, a little bit less in some sectors um, where the public supports curbs on foreign engagement. Next slide, please. Um, so why do they think the foreigners should be less involved in natural resource extraction? It's interesting because we asked a number of questions about what that reason might be. Uh, and we found that it's not related to greater environmental degradation. It's not related to greater corruption but it is related to um, a preference for 
Indonesian natural resources to be extracted by Indonesian organizations. So it's a it's an emotional or political argument rather than a environmental or governance argument. Next slide, please. Um, so when we look at the different sectors, I won't go into great detail because Kennedy, I, I imagine, will focus on that. Um, but here, just looking at the different sectors, we can tell that, first of all, when we look at plantations, so palm oil and rubber plantations, we see that um, there is quite positive attitudes towards this way of using natural resources in general, with two thirds of the public saying that these don't harm the environment. Now, uh, I was looking up some similar studies in the West, uh, and of course, uh, the degree of people in the West that think uh, palm oil, for example, harm the environment is far higher. Um, and I think this highlights an interesting point that we should always keep in mind is that um, Western attitudes towards conservation can be quite different uh, to attitudes um, in other countries. And in particular, um, and in particular, I think it should curb the uh, high-mindedness of Western uh, experts or Western uh, uh, advocates um, to also keep in mind the economic considerations that um, uh, that folks in uh, source countries have. Um, some, some call it also sort of conservation colonialism. I think we have to be very careful here. Um, and of course, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a high preference for state-owned enterprises to manage this sector. Next slide, please. Now, when we look at the mining sector, there's significantly less positive attitudes here. Um, only one third of the public say that it doesn't harm the environment. Um, but interesting that uh, a similarly high level says that despite the fact that it harms the environment, the benefits outweigh the harms. And this is a theme that we see again and again in each of the sectors. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so fisheries is an outlier in the sense that there's almost universal support for fisheries. 97% of respondents with knowledge of the fisheries sector uh, that it is a necessary and say that it is a necessary and benevolent activity. Um, so there's almost universal support for, fisher, uh, for fishing. Um, uh, three quarters of the public say that the main problem in fisheries are foreign vessels fishing in Indonesian waters. Um, and um, and there is also great concern about fisheries conducted at an industrial scale. So as you can see, the uh, emotional attachment to fisheries is quite different from, for example, mining. Um, there's also quite a lot of concern about the depletion of fishing stocks. More than half say that uh, these stocks have decreased over the last five years. So that's definitely something worth watching. No, it's fine. That's okay. okay. Click on this. Yep. Sorry. One more time, please. So I'll just skip ahead. Please click again. Um, uh, two more times. One more time. One more time. Okay. One more time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and to round up uh, my key takeaways here, um, so we've we've identified that um, uh, the public believes that corruption is bad and it is in fact getting worse. We've also identified that the public. Uh, cares very much about the environment uh, and believes that environmental degradation is a concern. Um, we've also identified that people believe that corruption in the environmental sector is quite high, both in regards to uh, illicit licenses and permits, but also in regards to political connections. Um, and we've identified that um, uh, state-owned enterprises are the preferred way to manage natural resources. And for us, this is somewhat paradoxical, to be honest, because um, if you've been following the Indonesian news, then there's no shortage of corruption scandals in state-owned enterprises. So if the public cares about environmental degradation and corruption, uh, saying that state-owned enterprises should manage them um, is uh, somewhat paradoxical. Um, our broad takeaway here is that um, that it is basically an accommodation that the public is making. The public understands that there are problems, even big problems related to environmental degradation, big problems to corruption in the sector. But at the same time, uh, the public also understands that it is necessary for economic development. 
and appreciates the economic benefits that come along, even at the cost of some degree of corruption, even at the cost of some degree of um, environmental degradation, and that these economic benefits can be best harnessed through the management by state-owned enterprises and collectives. Now, for us in the good governance anti-corruption community, this of course puts a tremendous uh, challenge because we're going to be trying to um, we're going to be trying to strengthen the governance skills of these institutions to respond to the great responsibility that the public puts on them. So, with that, uh, I'll hand over to my colleagues uh, and be happy to answer questions near the end. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Yuhani, for your um, overview of the survey. And just a reminder for everyone in the audience um, to please submit your question in the Q&A box. And if you're interested in reading the survey further, I'll put the link in the chat for everyone. So with that, my next speaker is Kennedy Muslim, who will present um, two different surveys and make a comparison between the two in relation to what Yuhani just presented. Um, Kennedy is a senior researcher at the Indonesian Survey Institute and Indicator Politik Indonesia. He obtained his bachelor's degree from Ohio State University and earned a master's degree at the Paramadina Graduate School of Political Communication from the University of Paramadina. His primary research interest is Indonesian politics, media and, and technology, as well as international relations. And with that, Kennedy, please take it away. Thank you, Srinit, and thank you, Juhani, for the very illuminating, insight, insightful presentation. So my presentation right now will focus on two things, and I hope my presentation will serve as a smooth transition to Pak Laude, who is an expert in corruption. So my presentation will focus on the uh, two separate surveys, uh, one, the one we did with Basel Institute with LSI, and the other is the recent survey on on the month of September, we did on the National Youth Survey on Climate Change. This is done by Indicator uh, with one of the foundation in green climate change uh, issues. So I will start my presentation and we'll try to share my screen now. Okay, before that, uh, Juhani has already give us a background on the objective of the survey we did with Basel Institute on the green corruption issues. So I will skip this part on the background and I will go briefly on the methodology that we did for our survey with Basel Institute. So this survey uh, had, is done during the peak of the second wave of COVID in Indonesia. That's why we are we are choosing telephone survey for it's because it is the most feasible way to conduct the survey at that time in July. So the, the way we did the survey is by using what we call a double sampling method. During the last three years, LSI has done hundreds of face-to-face -face or in-person survey and we have managed to, to have a database of almost 300,000 respondents distributed throughout Indonesia. And on average, 71% of them have a phone number contact. And from those telephone number contact, we randomly distributed the sample of the respondent. Uh, we, we managed to gather 2,580 respondents and 1,200 1, of those respondents are sample from all province in Indonesia, which are proportionally distributed. The additional respondent we pick in four provinces in South Sumatra, Central Java, East Kalimantan, and North Sulawesi. This is selected based on the criteria of the level of corruption and the contribution of natural resource from those provinces. The margin of error for the survey is around 2.88% at 95% confidence level. So this, I will go briefly, these are the survey sampling flow chart. And these are the part, how do we do the double sampling method of the phone survey. So these are the 300,000 respondents that we, we managed to gather in our database so far in the last three years. 
and those with the phone contact will be contacted by us uh, proportionally distributed in in all the provinces in indonesia and these are the sample against the population and we see the sample distribution match uh, almost perfectly with the population based on the uh, bps or central bureau of statistics in indonesia based on the gender rural urban age group religion and ethnic as well as the provinces so before that i will start with the the survey in um, uh, the united states that i quote from the pew research center as in january 2020 we can see that that the issue of climate change has has been creeping up and become the zeitgeist issue in in the green movement in the western countries uh, in terms of protecting the environment and dealing with global climate change we can see the number is keeps increasing and we will see whether it holds through also in indonesia these are the comparison of the two surveys that i mentioned briefly in the beginning so these are the general survey of the LSI and Basel Institute in, we did in July 2021. We can see that the corruption, uh, employment, economic growth that Pak Juhani has already mentioned before. And the climate change here is uh, in, of the lower concern for the, for the gen, Indonesian general public. And as we can see, these are the national youth survey. These are the most ma massive survey because we we have we are conducting the survey in person survey with uh with four thousand respondents for the gen z for the 17 to 70 26 years old respondents and the millennials 27 to 35 years old this survey has been conducted in september 2021 around two two months ago and we can see the the list of priorities about the concerning issues for the respondent between the general public and the youth respondents in the survey are almost identical corruption issues managed to be the top rank issues that has been the most concerning issues for the respondent but here environmental degradation for the youth our young respondents uh, managed to score higher than the employment issues here and uh, cl the climate change is a bit below even though it's higher compared to the general survey and next this has been touched briefly also by by juhani before that there is a increasing concern that the issue of corruption is uh, very critical right now in indonesia based on the general public perception and I will break down the perception of corruption level based on the sociodemography. As we can see, it's dominated by the younger respondent who perceive that corruption issue has, has reached an alarming level in Indonesia. <coughs> and for the ethnicity, it's dominated by the Betawi or the, the natural ethnic in the capital of Jakarta. And also dominated by the blue color and the state uh, apparatus and the edu from the education and income level it's dominated by the middle income and the higher education level and the urban as we can expect this is commonsensical the urban population has better access for information for the media reports on the corruption news in indonesia and for the region it's dominated by those in banten province jakarta and central java now i will move shift my demographic breakdown on the level of concern for various environmental issues by socio demography this is from our youth survey so as you can see the three issues in regarding the pollution climate change and environmental degradation are dominated are and has a tendency to be expressed the highest higher concern by the female respondent 
and also the young the younger the Gen Z group is also has a <clears throat> higher concern toward the climate change and the environmental degradation. In terms of the ethnicity, it's dominated by the same with the Betawi and also the Sundanese in West Java and the Javanese also. In terms of education, we can see the higher the education and income level, uh, the higher the concern of the environmental degradation issues and the climate change issues. And the white color is also uh, dominating the concern for the environmental issues. In terms of the urban rural, it's the same pattern with the corruption issues. The urban, the urban population has a higher concern toward the environmental degradation and the climate change as well as the pollution. And in terms of the region, we can see it's dominated by the uh, respondents in Java Island and also in Kalimantan. It's Now, this is the most glaring example that I think Pak Laude can comment more here. Uh, when we ask our youth respondent, in your opinion, state the main problems that are the most pressing issues for Indonesia to solve at the moment, we can see a very high gap here between the corruption issues and the jobs or, or unemployment issues in, in our youth survey. These are very different from the the general public survey we found, because usually in the general public survey, the economic sector will, will usually dominate the, the most pressing issues here. And the protecting natural environment, it's, although it's very small, it's, but the main key takeaway here is the corruption issues has been very glaring uh, in, in our young generation of Indonesians. Here is also a very interesting finding we found uh, that we try to gauge the sentiment whether our youth uh, feels that we uh, when they were presented with two statements, we should protect the environment even though it slows the economic growth. The, yeah, the youth, Indonesian youth, the Gen Z and the millennials, uh, there's a very uh, high, high trend in, in terms of their agreement with the statement that, that we should protect the environment even though it slows the economic growth. And only 15% of the total respondent, youth respondents, those with whose age are 17 to 35 years old who, who said we should prioritize economic growth at the expense of the environment. These are very different from the general public survey uh, the general public survey usually has around 50-50 here in the, the number. So this is a very high, high gap here. So the, the zeitgeist of the green movement has infiltrated the perception of uh, Indonesian youth. And even at the rural respondents, we, we found the, the number here is also very high, it's uh, above 70, even though it's higher in the urban population. Now, the last one is environmental issues on, and climate change. If when we ask the, our youth respondent if they agree or disagree with the following statements, and we can find that the issue of protecting the environment are still dominating uh, they, uh, by our youth views. Protecting the environment is, is, uh, is very important, even though there are all other, other problems. And when we ask if, if Indonesia can afford to, to protect the environment, uh, like the, even though we are not a rich country, they, they disagree, uh, the majority of them disagree with this statement also. So these are all have been touched by uh, Johani earlier. So I will try to skip this part. And also, this the attitude toward foreign investment has also been explained by Pak Johani, and this also. So I will try to make a several key takeaways and conclusion. Indonesian people generally do not view economic development and environment as mutually exclusive priorities. So there's 
there is a balanced view between the economic growth and the environmental protection issues. These are based on the LSI and Basel survey, but in the youth survey, these numbers are, as we can see earlier, it's a different priorities for our youth. And in the public perception, the management of natural resource, the resource, the nationalist and state-run oriented sentiment are still dominating the public perception in Indonesia. So the anti-foreign sentiments are not due to corruption issues or environmental issues, but rather because of nationalism and the prejudice toward the foreign companies. So I will close my, my presentation with this tongue-in-cheek uh, expression uh, by maybe this, this quote has been stuck with me when I was in the US. So uh, when we, it's the quote attributed to Winston Churchill, if you're not a liberal, maybe you can change this to progressive here. Uh, when you're 25, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative, by the time you're 35, you have no brain. So that's it from me. Uh, I, uh, I will hand it to you, Srinath, and to Pak Laude next. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that. I find it very interesting, the difference between, you know, uh, the public perception and what is really, you know, concern of the youth and it, you know, climate change being, you know, here in the U.S. is such a, a predominant issue to see it sort of, um, there's a parallel um, uh, sort of concern in within Indonesian youth uh, as well. So with that, um, our final speaker is Dr. Laude Siarif who will give his thoughts on how the survey findings fit within the broader political environment and anti-corruption effort in Indonesia. He is the Executive Director of Partnership for Governance Reform, which is a leading Indonesian civil society organization focusing on good governance. And between 2015 and 2019, he was the Commissioner of Indonesia's Corruption Eradication Commission or the KPK, and during which he led some of the biggest cases the agency undertook during the um, uh, uh, including complex international investigations against well-connected politicians. And prior to KPK, he was a lecturer and trainer on environmental governance and corruption issues. Um, this included a principal trainer of the Supreme Court. He holds a PhD from the University of Sydney. And Dr. Ziarif, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share some of uh, our uh, previous works on how to address corruption in Indonesia, especially on corruption in natural resources. Uh, I think the two survey, as is already uh, explained by the two previous speakers, that uh, corruption is still uh, one of the main uh, important issues uh, uh, here in Indonesia because. If you look at our corruption perception index, uh, it is only 37. Uh, and it is actually decreased. Uh, when I left the KPK, the, uh, our corruption perception index for 2019 was uh, 40. Uh, uh, and in 2020, uh, uh, down three points. Uh, uh, which is actually higher than United States. Uh, United States only down to point uh, uh, during Trump in 2020. Uh, so this is actually, it has never happened before in Indonesia uh, uh, that actually uh, down on point, uh, even one point in the last 20 years. But uh, in the last, uh, just, just one year after we left the KPK, uh, the trust of the people uh, uh, to the government it is very, very, uh, I think it's, it's quite bad. Uh, this is my miserable previous life when I was a corruption eradication uh, uh, commissioner. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it is easier because you can see all the suffering, you know, because we, if you look at, I'll explain it a little bit later on, but I think we better go. 
Uh, and I would like also to share that uh, fighting corruption, I think it is a noble call, but at the same time, it is quite risky. For example, it is my house, for example, says attack with Molotov cocktails in the middle of the night. Uh, fortunately, one bottle actually around here is, was not uh, explode. So the cars in this garage is not actually exploded at that particular night. But uh, this is Indonesia. I think it's Indonesia. Uh, for those uh, of you who are not familiar with Indonesia, Indonesia it is quite rich in natural resources. Uh, I think we have all minerals. Uh, uh, you name it, and we have it. Uh, and, and we are also well, quite good in forest marine resources, uh, even uh, uh, classified as mega diversity country. Uh, uh, together with Brazil, uh, Congo, and Indonesia. So, uh, but corruption and mismanagement has put Indonesia natural resources in dangers. As you can see from the pictures, uh, the pollution, this is for mining, and this is the opening of uh, natural uh, forests uh, for palm oil plantation. And as you can imagine that, they always bribe someone to get this uh, big concession. Uh, and it is actually uh, reflected in the uh, corruption cases that we prosecute. For example, there are several conflict, conflict with governors. This is incomplete portrait, actually. Just I just gave you uh, some uh, example and mayors, and, and most of them actually related all of them actually related to natural resources exploitation. This guy, the, uh, the governor from Southeast Sulawesi, he gave a license for mining company. These two guys to govern of three hours, they give a kind of like illegal license and they're taking bribe and give a license for farm work plantation. And similar to this, this one also in East uh, Kalimantan governors, and this is mayor, uh, uh, to Bupati, this one is still in the process. So all of them are involved in taking a bribe, mostly for licensing process. And not only them, but actually even the parliamentarian, the head of organization agency, member of parliament, the minister, uh, uh, this is the two ministers, those are related to uh, natural resources. Why? I think because they are, because as you can imagine that there's such natural resources, there's a lot of money. So that's why it is very prone for uh, corruption. And the people behind those people, the people who actually give a bribe, are, are mostly uh, uh, Businessman, uh, businesswoman, and this woman actually one of the richest women in Indonesia, for example, he gave a bribe uh, also for palm oil plantation uh, uh, and many more. Uh, so, if you look at the modus operandi of corruption, this includes like a bribe, I think it's take the top priority, embezzlement, money laundering, tax, and reality manipulation. And of course, there are several uh, violations of environmental law, forestry law, mining law, plantation law, and many, and many more. Why they give a bribe, for example? One is to secure illegal licenses, I mean, to get a license, and to avoid prosecution. So they try to bribe the police uh, uh, or the ministries, uh, or, or they are trying. Uh, or people from uh, Supreme Audit Board, for example. So they always try to avoid those, so they are willing to give a bribe. Uh, this is a case study uh, uh, from the KPK Awards when I was uh, in the KPK. Uh, one is that it is such a bribe uh, in relation to the uh, establishment of power plants uh, Coal based power plant, which is involving a member of parliament, uh, the ministers, uh, 
two businessmen, uh, even including uh, 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 the head of National Electricity Company, the CEO of, of National Electricity Company, but later on acquitted uh, by the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, the modus of Karandi was the government project tried to establish this coal power plant close to the coal mining, which is actually part of the government project. Uh, two businessmen, his name is Mr. Johannes Kocho and Mr. Samintan, uh, uh, is trying with, they are also actually uh, involving Chinese. Uh, a company called China Guardian Engineering Company and proposed the establishment of power plant plus coal mining near the, the, the mining site. So in order to get a license to, to give them a green light, they bribed one of the parliamentarians from uh, energy missions. They even actually uh, uh, bribed uh, Idus Mahan, parliamentarian, they become Minister of Social Affairs to influence Mr. Sofian Basir, the CEO of our National Electricity Company, uh, uh, to sign an agreement. Uh, but the KPK uh, got red handed uh, Mr. Johannes Kocho and Ms. Annie Saragi. I mean, these ladies uh, uh, and, and the orange, uh, we caught them red handed when the transaction actually said, uh, but the money moved from this guy to this lady uh, in the house of this uh, minister. Uh, so my team actually uh, caught them that handed. Uh, another one case that is nickel related corruptions. The actor it is the governors and Mr. Nur Alam. And this one are uh, the CEO of PT Anugra Harisma Baraka and also PT Billy of Billy Indonesian Limited. And also he uh, established a company in Hong Kong called Riscop International in Hong Kong. Just, uh, this is a puppet company so that uh, to make us difficult to trace the money. So this Riscop International uh, established in Hong Kong, uh, actually wire transfer of money, which is for almost 5 million US dollars to these governors. Uh, to give him uh, a, a license to mine nickel in a small island, which is under the Indonesian law, you cannot mine a small island. But uh, uh, this governor just give, granted him a license to mine. Uh, this is actually uh, the, the, the extract of the case, which is 1D. Uh, applied for nickel mining in the small island of Kabaena, which is actually where I came from, uh, Southeast Sulawesi. The governor's alarm changed the status of protected area of the forest and granted mining license to this particular guy. And Mr. Alam received a, a, a bribe, 4.5 million from Rich Cop International Hong Kong, which is subsidiary company or puppet company of uh, AHB uh, Limited here in Indonesia. But he's in jail now, uh, 12 years in jail, and I have to pay fine. And Mr. Aswindi it is not, he's still in the process. Uh, if you are interested to read more, uh, I think we just published with Sophie, this one, tackling forestry corruption in Indonesia, just, uh, yes, still this year. Uh, uh, also, if you look at, if you want to see Corrupt network of natural resources. Uh, you can actually read this. It is the same publication. Uh, I mean, uh, so I'm involved in these two publications. This one is more politic, and this one it is more kind of law. I don't know you guys actually which uh, uh, are you going to study law or public policy, but I don't really uh, know. But I mean, if you guys are interested, uh, feel free, and you can find them on the net. Uh, uh, after that, uh, we did some kind of like a few attempts to prevent and to combat corruption and resources, not only prosecuting, but also we uh, try to create a program to prevent corruption. For example, uh, uh, 
the KPK uh, established a movement called National Movement to Save Indonesian Natural Resources, where the presidents uh, and the Indonesian National Police, the Attorney General Office, even the military, actually signed uh, some kind of like a declaration to save the Indonesian natural resources in the front of the presidents. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I think this initiative it is not yet fully continued by the KPK and the people who actually signed this. Um, when I was there, uh, uh, I was in the KPK, we tried to assist uh, the development of natural resources corruption, the system development at, for example, assisting the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources to, develop, to establish uh, Minerba One Map Indonesia. Minerba it is minerals and energy, uh, 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 One Map Indonesia, which is MOMI. And also we push the government to establish or uh, to issue beneficial ownership registration. Uh, which is actually uh, the president actually signed it, and I am uh, uh, proud of it because the United States you don't have this, uh, uh, only UK uh, 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 and Indonesia. Uh, uh, so I mean, and this is still controversial. It is actually pushed by Nigeria in the next uh, conference of the party of of United Nations Convention Against Corruptions but it's still controversial. It is not yet followed. So I hope they come up with uh, one declaration in, in Egypt that uh, beneficial ownership registration it is to be mandated. Uh, uh, and I don't really think the US actually uh, or many other country want to uh, go this way. UK, they already have. Uh, we are also assisting, for example, uh, the Ministry of, uh, of Environment and Forestry to establish called Simontana National Forest Monitoring Systems and Online Information System for Forest Product Management. Because uh, these technology, you make them online, uh, so they become it very transparent. So the technology uh, can improve transparency and accountability and has the potential to prevent corruption if actually managed by people with integrity. Uh, we cannot just trust the technology because it is always really, really depends on the people behind that particular technology. And lastly, the take home meals from me that uh, natural resources corruption are always involved in high ranking public officials. Uh, and private sector that have influence in political and administrative decision. And usually we call them PEPs, uh, politically exposed persons. Uh, and also big uh, natural resources corruption is usually involving foreign actors. As you can see from the case study that I saw you, so that's why uh, Johanne uh, and Basel Institute and OECD last time we had this a specific uh, special seminar, uh, uh, just try to look at uh, 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 what you call it, uh, just like uh, uh, a change of custody of, uh, I forgot the English term of it, you know, uh, but actually you can actually see who actually. Uh, Supply chain, yeah. Yeah, the supply chains, uh, the supply chains of, of, of raw materials and the banking, also the people and actors uh, in particular cases. So the supply chains, it is actually need to see it uh, because not only like country like Indonesia, which is actually or Congo or, or, or Nigeria, but also this is involving a big, uh, uh, kind of like a chain, uh, international. So you guys need to see that. Uh, the modus operandi of big natural resource corruption is always sophisticated because uh, always involving foreign uh, uh, actors and also some usually they like I choose Hong Kong, for example, in the case of Nur Alam, uh, 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 they establish as puppet company just 
the purpose of that particular company just try to bribe someone here in Indonesia. So therefore, I think robust national and international cooperation is the key uh, 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 if you want to be successful in prosecuting big natural resource corruption or to prevent corruption in the future. So that's why um, uh, I like to speak with students. So I think because the futures of our common heritage of mankind, it is in your hand, it is not us anymore. And I thank you so, so much. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, so we are slightly um, behind schedule a bit, um, but let's open up the floor for the Q&A session. Um, as a reminder to everyone, if you have a question, please submit them now. Um, but to start off with, I do have a question for, um, uh, I'll start with uh, Dr. Siarif and also Yuhani. So the first question is for, to, uh, for Dr. Siarif. Um, since you have a firsthand knowledge of, you know, you've done anti-corruption work, um, what would it take to rebuild that trust in the KPK, in your opinion? And for Yuhani, how does Excuse me, can you repeat? Can you repeat oh, your questions? Yes. Yeah, well, I just lost your... Essentially, what would it take to rebuild the trust in the KPK? And for Yuhani, um, you know, since there is that decline in trust, how would that affect your work at the Basel Institute and, you know, other um, similar institution in trying to um, sort of enforce and prevent um, crimes that contribute to environmental degradation? So I guess, um, uh, Dr. Sir, um, if you'd like to go first. Yes, I think in order to regain the trust of the people uh, uh, to KPK, if you actually, your question it is actually about how to improve the trust uh, of the people to, to KPK. Uh, is that your question or? Sorry, say that again. Uh, your question was uh, how to improve uh, people's trust. Uh, yeah, yeah to, to, to the KP again, right? It, yeah, I think once uh, they have to show that uh, they actually, there are several anti-corruption agency in the world. There are many actually, but in the past, KPK was always considered quite a good one. Uh, 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 we have like ICAC in Hong Kong, we have Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commissions, we have Service for Office in UK, and of course we have FBI in the United States. Uh, 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 and uh, if those agency can actually catch the big fish, it will uh, uh, regain the trust of the people that those institutions are actually good uh, are to do their job. The, and many others anti-corruption agencies, they just doing what they call it like a prevention. What they do, it's mostly like education and, and actually trying to, uh, uh, to give a, a red flag for example, uh, uh, to the governments, uh, like for example, I don't know what to say it, but that for example, uh, the ombudsman in, 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 in the Philippines, because they also have a power to investigate and to prosecute uh, uh, corruption, but they never have a, a big case. Uh, so the level of trust, it is actually uh, quite low. Uh, similarly, when actually in Nigeria during Nuhuri Badu's time, uh, uh, he was actually trying hard to prosecute high-ranking officials uh, and they dissolved the agency and even knew have to flee the country to go to UK because of, uh, yeah, it is quite difficult uh, for him to stay. Uh, uh, so, in order to regain the trust of the people again, I think the KPK has to show 
to the people in Indonesia and also people outside Indonesia, they actually still work uh, uh, professionally. They still actually, uh, they are not afraid to investigate uh, high ranking public officials. Uh, uh, so if they can still do that, even though uh, the KPK during my time and the current KPK is different because during my time we are fully independent and the current KPK with the new law, it is actually, uh, it is under the executive. But if you look at ICAC in Hong Kong or the FBI, it is also under the executive, even part of the DOJ, but if they can do their job properly, uh, I think they can regain the trust again from the Indonesian people. Okay, and uh, to you, Yohani? Yeah, thank you. It's, you you've, you've touched on probably the most difficult challenge in, in Indonesia. Um, I, I agree with everything that, that Laude said, of course. Um, and he knows that the challenge is far better because he experienced them firsthand. Um, I'd say as a sort of, as a observer, interested observer um, in, in the situation over the last um, 10 years or so, um, unfortunately, the aberration isn't the current situation. The aberration is the um, exceptional period of success that KPK enjoyed uh, until the current loss of independence or the current decrease of independence. Um, it, if you look at anti-corruption agencies worldwide, especially in challenging political environments, they don't tend to be successful, unfortunately. Um, it really create it really requires an unusual confluence of um, factors to allow for that success and KPK was by those standards I would say perhaps the most successful anti-corruption agencies for a long time um, I think the uh, the challenge that comes with that is that the entire because of having this exceptionally powerful if you will locomotive of the anti-corruption train um, everybody else was sort of uh, supporting the KPK and that was right and just um, because KPK was so impressive. Um, as this distribution of power shifts now, um, it will require those of other government agencies, uh, civil society, uh, the private sector to change the role they play in the anti-corruption field. It becomes a much more decentralized process, if you will. Uh, and that uh, you were asking about sort of uh, addressing corruption risks related to the environmental sector with this change in the uh, anti-corruption infrastructure it essentially means that one has to work with more partners, um, including some partners that might not have been as uh, easy and cooperative as the CAPEC in the past years has been. So, so it really requires a rethink um, and it requires us to look at the experience uh, of some countries that uh, have struggled with democratic backsliding, uh, frankly, um, to see what lessons to avoid as the potential for that um, increases in Indonesia as well. Great, thank you for that. Um, we are behind, but if you want, if you don't mind sticking around for another five minutes um, um, to answer a couple more questions from our attendees, that would be great. Um, so we have one person who is interested in tech solution of online mapping that uh, Dr. Sierra explained. Um, the question is, could that really prevent forest mafia oligarchs, corruption politicians to engage in corruption? Um, I don't know um, who would like to answer this one. Basically the, the, the attendees saying that we don't really know the efficacy um, knowing that licensing concession rights overlap is still happening. So um, how could that really, how could technology prevent um, those from engaging in corruption? Um, I mean, I can try to, to take a first crack at it. Um, so um, my, my perception of uh, tech solutions that, that they're really not solutions they're they're tools right um and uh, like any tool 
uh, how you use it um, highly influences your ability for it to be effective or not at achieving its result. And so um, having the tools, for example, online mapping or uh, uh, concessions in itself doesn't solve very much, right? It's what you do with it, both on a prevention and an enforcement perspective. And so given all the other challenges that we talked about uh, in the anti-corruption um, firmament, so to say, uh, it's no surprise that these tools haven't yet quite lived up to their expectations. Um, I think, uh, yeah, there's no, there's no quick fixes here, um, unfortunately. Um, but having said that, some of these tools can really allow us to uh, gain a leg up because uh, as the corrupt folks innovate and collaborate, so must we. Uh, and so in a way, there, there's a challenge even just keeping up with them sometimes, uh, never mind beating them at their own game. So yeah, I, I'm a I'm big fan of these tools, uh, although I would add that it really requires the political will to actually implement them as well as having the tech solutions. Um, would uh, Dr. Sarivo, uh Kennedy, do you have anything to add on to that? Uh, I see a lot of question in question and answer, so I think they are quite uh, quite good, quite good question, and I think I'll try to answer one or two of this question. For example, uh, uh, why not many companies actually nab to the jail in forestry in for example, plantation, or for example, in Palawan case, and, and many other questions. Uh, yes, this particular case, I think before I joined the KPK, but one, I actually check it when I actually wrote that particular article with Sophie, uh, uh, and we can actually see it. Uh, those uh, uh, company, uh, I mean, the Palala one uh, case, uh, thank was Munjafar, he actually established like seven, uh, more than 10 companies and actually seven given to his, uh, uh, to himself and to his family. Uh, 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 but at the same time, like several big companies behind it, it is not, it is quite difficult to prove that actually the money that he received, it is actually came from uh, uh, those big plantations. Uh, uh, so I think this is, uh, that's what I'm actually saying, it is always sophisticated. Uh, they trying to cut the, the link uh, uh, between the people who actually blind and the people who really benefited uh, from the particular crime. Uh, uh, so, yeah, it is the limitation of the law, and and because if we are actually, I don't know exactly how they did the investigation at that particular time because I was not uh, uh, in the KPK. But when actually trying to check it, uh, there are several uh, uh, cases. Uh, it is so difficult to find the link, but even though we knew that they are actually benefited but it is so difficult to find like hard proof or hard evidence uh, to prosecute those uh, uh, people. And the second, uh, uh, what is the, uh, uh, what is my opinion about the omnibus law on natural resources in Indonesia uh, is it will decrease or increase corruption in natural resources. Uh, if I actually look at, if you see that, for example, licensing can create corruption with an omnibus law, I actually try to cut that. But this will benefiting uh, the oligarch, yeah, uh, the people who actually already have a uh, 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 power to control uh, it's a natural resources. And again, I don't really think that actually it will reduce significantly the corruption incident on it because uh, even uh, can create a new uh, collusion between the governments 
and and and, and the private sectors. And we have to be in mind that many public officials are actually also businessmen. So for example, I don't know to mention name, but I mean, several ministers are involving, they are actually a, a bigger, one of those bigger miners in Indonesia. Uh, uh, the head of people assembly, for example, he also uh, uh, on uh, Indonesia's uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, and even, so this is kind of like a collusion between, uh, that's why I keep saying that uh, natural resources corruption sophisticated and always involving high ranking uh, uh, and, and public officials. So that's why it is make it even more difficult to tackle. And in fact, I think why the KPK, uh, it is actually the law of KPK actually changed, maybe because uh, I'm not regret it, but maybe because we are too uh, aggressive on, on the common, especially when we actually introduce and we push for corporate criminal liability. And I heard that uh, many Indonesians, businessmen actually really, really hate that. I think uh, that's all. Uh, the last one, uh, those technology uh, that I just said, yes, uh, those technology, it is are used to map the existing, the existing, uh, for example, the MOMI, the existing licenses. So, and the existing licenses, it is already overlap. Uh, 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 so uh, that's particular, the MOMI stuff, for example, it is trying to fix those overlapping licenses. So it is hoped that in the future, there is no more overlapping licenses. For example, one particular Bupati in particular type, he give this a company like this, and another one, and they don't do anything about it. And the next mayors come, make another licenses actually in the top of that particular land. Uh, so for example, in North Kalimantan and South East Sulawesi, uh, the size of license for mining, it is actually uh, bigger than the actual size of the land in, 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 in Southeast Sulawesi. Fortunately, the power of Bupatis, of mayors, uh, it's now actually, they have no more power to give for licenses, but in the past, uh, that's why they're overlapping. Uh, and there are also several funny stories uh, they give us, uh, because we pushed, when I was in the KPK, we trying to assist the government to have this one, uh, one map, uh, uh, single map for all Indonesia. And those licenses, for example, some licenses for mining actually include waters or even actually the beach or even inside the city. So no wonders if you go to South East Sulawesi, you can actually see mining in front of the schoolyard. And in Kalimantan, it is actually in election commission office, only like a 30 meters from that. And they keep actually digging until the KPK came and they say, no, you have to change this. I mean, that that's the, a few realities that I'm not proud of of Indonesia, but I don't think this is actually happening in the United States. And thank you. Great. Well, thank you for that. It seems like you've answered um, all the questions that came through the Q and A. So thank you for that. Um, so since we covered um, all the questions, um, I guess I will take the opportunity to wrap up the webinar. So thank you everyone for attending today. I, and I think Sasha Kennedy have to say something, you know, as a closing uh, statement. 
<laughs> before you close it. <laughs> yeah, Kennedy, do you have any last minute thoughts on that? Uh, I'm just want to continue on Pak Laude's point. And I think our data has shown really clearly that uh, the concern of corruption has topped the rank in whether in public survey or in the youth survey. This could be an incentive enough for our politician to, 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 to put the corruption issues on the top of their uh, campaign message or agenda and hopefully uh, the civil society in Indonesia also can push the corruption issues, even though the the uh, there is a decreasing level of trust toward the KPK at the moment, and it has been eclipsed by the trust for the police and in our last survey. But this should not be a, a, a cause for a pessimistic scenario ahead because uh, I believe uh, the young people are getting more critical and they have voiced their concern clearly that corruption issue is the most pressing issues, uh, even, even surpassing the economic growth or the employment issues. This can be a uh, ringing bell for the, our politician to take this issue seriously in the future. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you to everyone on the panel for joining us today on this very interesting topic.